This lecture has been made available to you courtesy of the American Numismatic Society. Uh, we have Dale Lukinich here who is going to give us a talk on script issued for the Illinois and Michigan Canal. Uh, so a rather local, localized talk, which I think is great. Um, Dale and I first met, I think, in April of this past year at the Central States Club, where he uh, approached me about giving one of these long table talks and we're finally able to have them here, uh, which is great. Um, I did some internet sleuthing and found out a little bit of information about you, Dale. I know that you started collecting coins at the age of 10, which is a great age to start collecting. Uh, and you are a member of many uh, numismatic uh, organizations going from very local, uh, like the Chicago yes. Club, uh, the Will County, uh, coin club up to larger, uh, you know, the Illinois Numismatic Association, Central States, uh, the ANA, and of course the ANS. Uh, so without further ado, uh, I'll let you get on with the topic. And, uh, and yeah, thank you everyone for coming and please enjoy. All right. Uh, number one, uh, thank you. Uh, it's a, a welcome, everyone. It's an honor. Uh, thank you to the ANA, ANS staff and to the ANS to let me share some of my passion and for all of you to take time to, to look in. Um, what I'm gonna talk about here is uh, less than honorable pol uh, political decisions, cost overruns, labor strife, and the, uh, the, the issues of the currency itself. Um, script and obsolete currency are kind of interchangeable. I'll be using that as I go through and uh, I've got a lot of slides to get, so let's, let's go. If a channel were cut through this ridge, one could sail from the Lake of Illinois to the Sea of Florida. Well, this is this quote is uh, uh, attributed to Jacques Marquette, and um, the Lake of Illinois is what we know now as Lake Michigan, and the Sea of Florida is the Gulf of Mexico. The ridge he's talking about when the glaciers were formed, uh, they pushed from north to south, and there was about a mile in front of that was a ridge about 10 foot high of debris and, and rock and mud and everything. Once they stopped moving north to south and started receding, that ridge stayed there. So there was areas between that ridge and Lake Michigan that were swampy and navigable by um, canoes. And there was spots on the other side of that ridge that were swampy that you could go with canoe all the way to some of the rivers in Illinois. And he said, man, if you just cut this a ridge through a, a, a channel through here, we can we can go all the way through. So here's what we're looking at. Uh, my cursor, if you guys can see that, coming up by Chicago, coming down through uh, and connecting at the Illinois River in Utica. So before the canal was built, and we're talking now, um, this this canal was not the boats on this canal were not powered by any type of an engine. They were pulled by mules. Uh, it took three to four days by wagon to get to uh, LaSalle, Illinois, from Chicago, one to two days by boat. So once the boats came in, that cut down the travel time quite a bit. And to St. Louis, it took a little over three days by boat. Um, so I'm going to give you a little bit of canal history. So again, I'm, I'm going to use my uh, 21st century Midwestern uh, accent. I'm not, I don't speak French, so I'm going to do my best on these names. But the French were seeking a, a trade route, the fur trade mainly because of the animals in, um, in and around uh, this area. A lot of beaver, a lot of uh, deer. Um, uh, muskrat sounds terrible, but they made uh, hats and stuff out of that. Plus the, the, uh, the birds. Uh, there's some beautiful pheasants and the, the, the plumage is just great. And so they were the, the French were looking for that. So in the, eight, the, the late 18, uh, 1670s, uh, General Fontenay of New France commissioned map maker Louis Joliet and to join forces with Father uh, Jacques Marquette to uh, explore this area. In 1905, Fort Dearborn is built. So the French established some forts, uh, not more than 10 miles from my house in a forest preserve. There's a big clearing where there was a French fort that stood at one time. And um, uh, in, in 1805, more and more people are coming around. 
So to protect, because this was Native American territory, uh, Fort Dearborn is built. If you ever come to downtown Chicago and you're on Michigan Avenue, just to the south of the river, and you look at the sidewalks, there's brass placards in mapping out where the uh, uh, Fort Dearborn was. In 1807, Secretary of the Treasury, uh, Albert Gallatin, reported that Chicago was home to a national uh, waterway, uh, canoe waterway. And, and he's, before that, he also spent time in the legislature in New York. In 1810, Congressman Peter Porter of New York tries to secure funds to project them uh, connecting the St. Lawrence Seaway to the Hudson River in the Gulf of Mexico. So here's two people from New York trying to promote uh, uh, a waterway in Illinois. Here are these two distinguished gentlemen. And here's what they're trying to do. Here's the, again, my cursor here, the uh, New York is down here. The uh, Erie Canal is built. So the boats can come up to the Erie, uh, up the Hudson River to the Erie Canal, over to Lake Erie, connect to all the Great Lakes. And here's the i &M Canal down here, down to the Illinois River. What you're not seeing on the West is all the, the territories and stuff from the West that the rivers that feed into here, uh, into the Mississippi River. So now you are opening up basically from the Continental Divide, you're opening up two thirds of the nation to a trade route. And uh, you know, that's, that's, just, that's just big. Shadrach Bond was the first governor of Illinois. He was elected in 1818. And part of his platform when he was elected was uh, to build a canal. Uh, the U.S. government has interest in the canal waterway, but now, now in 1818, when the state can do it, they can oversee it and not the Illinois and, 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 and not the federal government. But Shadrach Bond in his inaugural address urges the federal government to help the states with, uh, I, again, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, but it's not, we don't call it the Illinois-Michigan Canal around here. It's just uh, the I&M or the I&M Canal. Uh, a little bit of canal history where the where, the politics, the money, and the numbers. So 1822, a little after Illinois becomes a state, the legislature grants 90 feet, the federal legislature grants 90 feet either side of a potential canal. That's like telling your child that I'll help pay for your car, how much are the windshield wipers? That doesn't do much of anything. Um, a canal commission of five members are, are formed, and they are amassed Emmanuel J. West, Erasmus Brown, Theophilus Smith, Thomas Slew, and Samuel Alexander. I'm mentioning these names because you'll see these names pop up later on in different things. Uh, Justice Post, uh, an engineer and a map maker, uh, and the map maker, Paul, uh, Renee Paul, are hired. They're going to map out areas, and five, propo five proposed routes uh, and estimates are given to the Canal Commission. Now, the estimated cost at that time in 1824 was $716,000 in, in between that and $639,000. Wait till you see the final cost, uh, not even close. The politics, uh, in 1825, that canal commission was dissolved, the one that was first named. Uh, 1825, the state approved a joint, uh, a private joint stock company to build a canal. Uh, the private joint stock company raised a million dollars from investors, and there were Edward Coles, Shadrach Bond, former governor, uh, Justice Post, Erasmus Brown, William Hamilton, Joseph Duncan, another governor, and John Warwick. Um, they uh, they they were the joint commission for the for the stock company. Eighteen twenty seven. This company is dissolved. So two years it only lasted, still no money, not enough money. In 1827, though, the, the Congress grants five miles either side of the state uh, of, the, of the proposed canal. This amounts to 284,000 acres was given to the state of Illinois to do what they want. Now they can cut down timber, they can sell lots, they can you know, sell land, they can do whatever they want. A new canal, canal commission now was formed in 1829 uh, under pressure from the federal government. And it's uh, uh, Gresham Jane, Charles Dunn, and Edmund Roberts. And they hire a, name, a man by the name of James Thompson to be their surveyor. 
the idea of a railroad is brought up in 1831. Uh, in 1830 and 31, a commission was sent out and uh, they have a report, but it wasn't given to the General Assembly of Illinois till 1833, politics. Um, uh, and in 1832, that, that former Canal Commission is dissolved. This goes in and out, back and forth um, for a long time. In 1834, the chief of the Army Corps of Engineers said that the Illinois-Michigan Canal would be the most important public works. Um, the January 1st, I mean, I'm sorry, January 9th of 1836, a new Canal Commission is formed, but this is of only... Uh, Three men, William F. Thornton, Colonel uh, Gurdon S. Hubbard, and Colonel William B. Archer. Remember that name, William B. Archer. Because when you look down to the next slide, on July 4th, 1836, ground is broken by William Archer at Canalport. This was a city. It's now Bridgeport. It's part of the city of Chicago uh, by the Illinois River. If you guys are baseball fans, the White Sox play in the Bridgeport area. The reason Colonel Archer broke the broke the ground is uh, hard to believe, but the state bought the land from him. He was one that decided where the canal would go, and it just so happened to go through his property. Isn't that interesting? Um, the money, uh, those of you who collect hard times tokens would know about the depression that hits the U.S. in uh, 1837. By May 24th, 1837, the State Bank of Illinois suspends specie payment. No gold, no silver, no copper. So the canal funds would not be depleted. They haven't issued currency yet. They were paying out everything in, in hard money. In 1839, two loans are negotiated uh, in the eastern states for $1.3 million. One was the Phoenix Bank of New York for $300,000, and the other was the... Um, United States Bank in Philadelphia for $1 million. The, the state of Illinois opens the Branch State Bank at Chicago. It's near uh, LaSalle and Water Street. And script is going to be issued payable 90 days after issue. That's what script, the difference between script and, and regular currency is it has a date, uh, a pay by date. So you, they, you have to hold it for three months, 90 days before you can get paid. The Branch State Bank. Uh, in Chicago, funds are used in pork speculation. Shocking. Uh, in 1840, the, straight le the state legislature moves the Branch State Bank out of Chicago, the sinful city, to Lockport. This is a uh, from a book, uh, Development of Banking in Illinois, by a, a man by the name of Dowry. The cashiers and clerks of the Chicago branch, a lack of good judgment, to say the least, by engaging in pork speculation with two Chicago commissioner men. They used $26,000 of the bank funds. So these guys speculated and lost. And so the bank was moved out of Lockport or out of Chicago to Lockport, um, which is probably 25 miles maybe from my house. And uh, that's where the commission, uh, that's where the canal headquarters was. James Buckland, he's another uh, uh, engineer. He estimated the cost would be between four million. Uh, he estimated the cost would be four million dollars. Now we go from seven hundred thousand to four million dollars. The final cost was a uh, little uh, five point three million. Uh, but out of all the internal improvements that the state of Illinois did with other canals and bridges and roads, this is the only project that made money. Plus, the state of Illinois issued scrip expressly for the INM Canal for the Illinois Michigan Canal. All the other internal improvements, they issued script that says internal improvements. So that could be used any place. Uh, so in 1871, when the uh, trust was dissolved, there was $95,000 in cash uh, in the bank. Land was sold between a dollar and a quarter and $5 an acre. And I usually tell people that probably the Gold Coast in downtown Chicago was more expensive. Um, workers were mostly Irish. It pretty much depended on who the contractor was, uh, because the 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 96 miles of the canal had 195 different sections, and contractors bid on sections. 
So if, if you were of Italian persuasion, most of your workers were Italian. If you were Norwegian or, or from the Scandinavian countries, most of your workers. But predominantly, most of the workers on the canal were Irish, and they were paid a dollar a day plus a gill of whiskey. Boy, what could go wrong when somebody mixes construction workers, which I was for 38 years, and, and, and whiskey? Here's what could go wrong. I'm not going to read this whole letter. But it's from one of the supervisors and basically i can see that i cannot it would not be safe for me at this time to go upon my work i am presently unable to do so on account of the injuries received from the irish uh they beat this guy up did he deserve it i don't know what happened all i this is the state of illinois archives i found this letter um to kind of basically say that uh the the, the people who worked on that Canal were tough people. Not only were they tough people to some of the outside people, workers, worker riots between Irish clans near Ottawa after fighting Corkinians and the Fardmars are reported 15 people were killed and 60 were jailed. What I'm told in my, or what I found in my, uh, uh, in my research, Corkinians are from County Cork. The far downers are from any place else. It's either County Cork, either you're with us or you're against us. Listen to what these guys were fighting for. A visitor at, to the work camp site, one of the work camp sites in 1839, wrote that of the 1,500 workers, 500 men died from overexertion and disease. Water was not provided. Most of the time they drink the water out of the canal. I've seen estimates, I've seen a couple of these different reports, and one was as high as 700 people died. So I used a low estimate here. The workday in the summer was from 4.30 a.m. to 8.30 p.m. with few breaks. No food and no water was provided. Uh, it's a beautiful day here. It's in the 60s. But a week and a half ago, it was in the 90s with 75 to 80 percent humidity, and these guys were working that many hours, plus add the whiskey in. Um, you can see where it's a recipe for disaster. Income from the tolls, you can see that uh, in 1848. By 1860, 1866, it was $302,000. So they were making money. Uh, the last, the first boat went in 1848. Um, it was the name, the General Fry. You'll see a picture of General Fry later on. Uh, but the actual date of the canal opening was April 19th, 1848. Um, the actual cost was uh, $5 million when they got done, but all the tolls collected were $6.6 .6 million. So again, this project made money. Uh, total tons transported, 74 million tons were transported. The dimensions of the canal are 40 foot wide at the top, eight foot, uh, 28 foot wide at the bottom, and six foot deep. That was when it was built. Now you take a walk down there, there's spot, well, there's, for the most part, closer to Ottawa, farther west, it's dry. It has silted over. Um, there are some areas where you canoe, but not many. There's some times where the water is maybe a foot and a half deep at the most. The boats were 100 foot long, 18 foot wide. A 100 foot long rope was attached to the center of the boat, and a boatman was in the front. And it was pulled by a team of mules driven by a mule boy. These mule boys were 14 to 17 years old. I've got a grandson who's 14 years old. I can't see him doing this. And they said they excelled, these mule boys excelled in cussing and fighting. Um, just a note, Wild Bill Hickok, before he was Wild Bill, I believe, uh, was a mule driver um, in, in his younger days, uh, more to the west, down, down towards Ottawa, the western part of the canal. Here's a picture of a, an artist's rendition of what it looked like. Again, these boats did not have motors. It was a team of mules that pulled the boats along the river uh, both ways. And, and the, the fights would break out when boats would start coming. Who's going to yield the right of way? And the mule boys would fight because the faster they got their boat in, the faster they got paid. Uh, the, there was barns built every 15 miles to change out the mules. About three miles from my house is the last remaining mule barn. I'll show you a picture of that at the end. The population of Chicago went from 3,800 in 1836 to 14,000 in 1846. In 10 years, look at how it went up. 
The reason this area was selected for the canal, the city of Utica, where the canal ends, is 141 feet below this, the level of Lake Michigan. So in 96 miles, the elevation only drops 141 feet. That's flat. The canal was built in three divisions. The summit was from Chicago to Lockport. The middle was from Lockport to Seneca, and the western from Seneca to LaSalle. So here's a quick look at the population of Chicago, you know, starting out with 3,000. And here, uh, look at 1872, there are 300,000 people. Now, in all honesty, Chicago was annexing more land during this time, but you can see the population, how it just exploded in the area. The script itself, uh, there's three different sections of the script or three different series of the script. Okay, series of 1839. These are some names you're going to see the, the writers, you see names on the script. And all these, I'm not going to read this whole thing, but what these men have in common, the Black Hawk War, the Ameri the Illinois and the U.S. signed a treaty with uh, Chief Black Sparrow Hawk. Uh, he's never called Black Sparrow Hawk, he's called Black Hawk. And um, uh, it, Shocking. We didn't live up to our end of the treaty. So they figured, hey, you don't live up to your end of the treaty. We want our land back. And it didn't work out good. Uh, the war went on for quite some time. But uh, General McClernand was a, a, a general in that war. And he was rewarded for his service by being the uh, treasurer of the I&M Canal. General Jacob Fry. Again, that's a name that we, we talked about earlier. He was on the commission at one point. He was, a, he was a colonel in the Black Hawk War, and he was appointed the Secretary of Commission, uh, the Secretary of the Commission in uh, 1837, so he's on the board of the Island Canal. And uh, General Thornton, he fought during the War of 1812, and he was the uh, head of the commission uh, for, the, for the script. You'll see their names, and here are their names written. Here's McClellan, here's Fry, here's Thornton. So this is the first series, 1839. Uh, we don't know, there's no name on here who printed this, but it's possibly Murray, Draper, and Fairman just by the, the type of paper and some of the vignettes. The, 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 I, I'm trying to do some research and, and look to see what comparable, and that's pretty much comparable, but we don't know for sure. I can't say for sure. I've only heard, never seen, but heard of one sheet, uh, of, of one sheet that has sold that these notes were printed on, and there was a two fives, two twos, a one and a ten per sheet. You'll see some of this, these lines in here. I'll explain that in a little bit. Here's a a two dollar bill, and the um, here's a here's the actual serial number, but the number should be transposed two thirty five. 532. That's how they should be. This is a remainder. You can see that this was not signed, but this is in, this is signed here and here. There's another one, another remainder, not signed here. So these were ready for issue. They had their numbers, but they're not, they were not issued. Again, you see these numbers now, this looks a little bit more. There's a line here and a little bit of a line here. Again, I'll explain that in a little bit. Here's a 10, two things, 606, this should be 606, it's 660. About 5% of the notes, the numbers don't, don't line up. And so those are pretty scarce. What this X is, is when you turn the money in to get your hard currency, they canceled it. And what they would do uh, is they would put three, five, 10, depending on the amount, but they put a bunch of notes on a piece of leather and there was a hammer and there was an X that was in that hammer that has raised edges like a knife and they would hit that. The harder you hit it, the more prominent this X. You will see a lot of times on these notes that some of these triangular pieces are missing. They had to be at the top and got hit first. You see some of the notes that there's barely one of these lines in, they might've been at the bottom. 
Uh, but that's just part of the notes. So you see this X that was that was canceled. The money was turned in. Uh, here's a 50. This is the rarest note in this 1839 series. When I was looking for one of these notes, uh, it took me over six years to find one of these that came up for sale. And this one has the rare numbers that don't match up, 620, 629. The size of these notes are, the, this first series, is they're, they're hand cut. So they're not all exact. They're seven inches wide, three inches tall. And, and again, they're all trimmed by hand. So you want a nice square, perfect note, you're not going to find it. Here's a $100 note. Two different hundreds were made. Again, this one, seven. That might be a four O or it might be a six seven O, six seven nine. Here's the other series of 100. Same thing. There's no imprint name on this. We don't know who printed this, but this is bright white paper where the other was more of a yellowish paper. Um, but this is uh, eight inches wide and four and a quarter inches tall. These notes also, these lasted a long time because some of these are dated into 1840, 1841. But for the most part, these were issued in 1839. The series of 1840 and 1841, a new name appears is David Prickett. I just did Transylvania University because it sounded neat, but uh, that's in Kentucky. So, uh, you know, but he looks like he could be from Transylvania. But he was, uh, uh, he became now the new treasurer of the canal, so his name appears. There's also another name that appears is Joel Manning. I couldn't find a picture, but he was a lawyer. Um, but he was, he, he became uh, the treasurer. So here's the new notes. Note these two vignettes on the side. The man with the, the grain and, the, and the, the bees, the land of milk and honey, with the cow. Here's a hunter. There's, there's game to to uh to shoot and a cow these these two people will show up in another note in a little while um plus the note is issued by Rolden Roland White Rowden Wright and Hatch of New York so their name is imprinted down here okay you can see their name and these notes are about seven and three quarter inches wide and three and a quarter inches tall. Look at the name here now, Thornton. This is etched into the plate. This is, again, there's no date on here. There's no number on here. There's no anything on here, but his name is on there. Those were etched into the plate. Those came out uh, as they were printed. This is the famous cross-eyed buffalo. Everybody that collects these, that's what they, that's what they call them. Excuse me, but look at the signatures now. They're in blue. So they use blue ink, probably for a uh, security features. That's why you see Thornton's name is always in black because that was printed in. And here's our man again, uh, sitting with the gun and the cow. Ah, here are these two guys, but now they're next to each other and there's only one cow. So these vignettes, when you went to uh, Rolden White and Hatch and there were sheets of paper and you wanted fives on your notes, Here's a whole sheet of paper of fives. Which one do you want? These were blocks that were put into a, into the before before they were these notes were pressed, put into the uh, into the system, and you can these were all interchangeable. So other currency printed by these guys have this kind of fives, have these vignettes, has this kind of printing. You you did everything except something like this had to be hand done. Um, everything else was stopped. Here's a 10, the 10s, 20s, and 50s pretty much all come unissued. They're all remainders. To find one issued is really rare. Uh, but I, I use these because they look the best. Um, here's the 20. Here's an interesting note on the 50. Note this shield. That is very, very close, if not exact. If you live in Rhode Island, you'll remember, you'll see that that's a state shield of that's the state symbol of Rhode Island. The anchor it, it a, on this banner a little bit above it says hope, um, but somebody liked the picture, so they use it on an Illinois note. Here's the hundred dollar bill at that time. These were more checks than bills. So look at over here the one hundred is printed in, the one hundred 
the 100 is pretty much put together. Here they're separated and the 100 is handwritten in. Here is why. Because you could write a $120.50 note. This, you, you spread this out and you, if you collect these, you can get any myriad of denominations in here. Um, it's just, it's just kind of neat. And here's handwritten in, into there, the different denominations. Uh, this is a new printer, by the way, it's Holcomb and company. There's down on the bottom here under Thornton. Now his signature is now in blue. So this is not into the, uh, into the plate. And up here you see SC Childs. Uh, they were engraving, they were engravers from Chicago. You could do a whole talk on the tokens they made, the engravings they did. There's people that collect these notes just because of just these notes, because they have childs who are token collectors because of all the different um, tokens that they produce. The canal runs out of money. So now they're going to make some new notes. And they're indebtedness notes from 1842 to 1844. This is the Joliet newspaper, The Signal. And it says that uh, we received a letter from the from the uh, from Governor French stating that he is now prepared to uh, settle the script, the indebtedness notes. There are the contractors under the law uh, of the General Assembly, Joel Manning, the, the signer uh, from Lockport. He will pay out the money. This is 1847. Some of these notes were printed in 1842. Uh, 1844. So these guys had to wait a long time. Now they did get interest. They paid them interest, but you had to wait a long time to get your money. And here's what the indebtedness notes look like. They took about a eighth, to, uh, uh, three eighths of an inch, almost to the where it says Illinois Canal. They cut that off the bottom, flipped it over, and they printed this on the back. And before it, all the notes said payable within 90 days. This now says payable when funds are available. Uh, do so we owe you when funds are available they're not giving you a date i'm not going to show the backs of all of them because they're all the same so there's a two and a half is printed on a two and a half dollar note there's a five printed on a five dollar note again these are all hand cut so you see it's kind of a little little crazy in there but this is 1842 um so they didn't get paid till 1847. here's another one here's a 10 just printed on the back of a 10. If you collect these notes, this is the one to find and start with this one, if you can find it. Uh, uh, Mr. Fisher, uh, who was the dean of these notes when he when he uh, had a coin shop in, in uh, Decatur, Illinois, um, he said there's about 10 of these notes known only. This is the rarest note in the series. Um, here's the $50 indebtedness note. Here's the $100 indebtedness note. What they did is they took uncut sheets of ones, turned them sideways. This is the back of this note. They took uncut sheets of ones, turned them sideways, and printed the $100 notes. I show that because someone took the back. There's two $100 bills that were printed. They turned it sideways and cut a $1 out of it. The only one I've ever seen. Uh, so what someone did in the 1840s is they took two one they took two hundred dollars and turned it into a one dollar bill. Now, because you can see the printing on the back of this, how it goes. This might have been someone just saying, "Hey, we're not going to use these anymore anyway." Look at this, what I did, guys. You know, Friday at late in the afternoon, we're going to have some fun. Here's what the uncut sheet. I don't have a picture of the one. Uh, uncut sheet of, of ones and, and twos and fives, the two and a halfs and fives, those are really rare. There's probably only about four or five of those sheets known. This one is only probably about a eight or nine of these known. Uh, this is an uncut sheet, two tens, a 20, and a 50. These are some just oddball things that I have. Here's two consecutive serial numbers, 657, 658. These basically stayed together since 1839, uh, these two notes. And you can see the cut canceled, so these were turned in. In 1840, they were looking for money. They also, also issued stock in England. This is just a coupon of one of the bonds. They only issued 60,000 pounds of 
of bonds. I have, I have again, I've seen a picture and not a good picture. I've contacted Spink. I've contacted bond dealers in England. No one has ever seen one of the bonds, but this is one of the coupons. It's 13 pounds, 10 shillings uh, that someone turned in to get paid. Oh, one more thing. Uh, we're almost at the end here, but this is Governor Matson. Governor Matson's for, uh, originally from Joliet, or was born in, in New York, but he lived in Joliet where I was grew up, and he was a 10th governor of Illinois. And on his way from probably Chicago, he passed through Lockport um, by the uh, canal headquarters, and they gave him $388,000 worth of canal script to be turned into the state on his way down to Springfield. It never showed up. And uh, he didn't know that he was innocent. He, he didn't know what happened. And uh, so out of the goodness of his heart though, he paid 250 some thousand dollars to the state of Illinois because he just felt bad of what happened. And when he got out of office, him and his family he ended up moving to uh, Europe. So here's the, my, my references. Uh, this the second one here, the Illinois Guide to Economic History. This is produced by the uh, or printed by the, the uh, University of Chicago. This is from 1916. This is a great book for nuts and bolts and dollars and who did what and where. This is a, a, a great book. All the rest of these are just um, essays. And uh, John Lamb, the Lewis University has a whole building a whole room in their library dedicated just to the i &M canal and john lamb was the curator at one time he's now retired um that's it any questions here's some pictures i've got at the end that i'll just show nobody okay um, this yeah, is... We do have one question in oh, the sure. chat. Uh, is the I and M Canal now called the S and N Canal? No, it's it's still the I and M Canal or the Illinois Michigan Canal. I don't know if that one's in Illinois because there's a Hennepin Canal. There's a, there's several canals that the Illinois built. Again, you talk about politics in Illinois. The Hennepin Canal was built when they knew the railroad was coming through and built it anyway, and they didn't even build it wide enough for a boat to fit on it. But the legislature says it's time, it, we appropriated this money to build this canal, and they built it. And it, it's basically a canal to nowhere. It doesn't lead anywhere. Um, this is in the fall, walking on the on the I&M Canal. Here's where the mule boys walk. Uh, this is the canal on this side. Obviously, none of these trees were here. This is the Illinois River right here on this side. Um, but my wife and I walked 1,200 miles on this last year. Uh, we do about 100 miles a month when we walk. So this is where we walk. Uh, this is about three miles from my house. Here's what you see on the canal. There's some, just some beautiful different times of the year. Uh, you see deer down there. This was a day I took my camera down. It was snowing so hard. I stopped and counted 10. You can hardly see my footprints in here. It was snowing so hard. We walked 52 weeks a year. Uh, this is the day after that on a bright, sunny day. So in my area, this is in uh, in between Jolie, uh, in between Manuka, where I live, and Morris. This is one of the lock tenders. So this he lived in this house. And he would open up the locks as the boats came through. Again, there's 19 locks on this. Here's the mule barn. Uh, this is the last one. This is, again, about three miles from my house. This is where the mules would stay. And there was one of these every so many miles to, to change the mules out. This is the, this is, these are the people that own the mule barn. This is right across the street from them. This was an inn. This is the town of Dresden. There is no town of Dresden anymore but the oldest uh, uh, right across the Illinois River from this house in the mule barn is the oldest nuclear power plant in the country. And it's the Dresden nuclear power plant. It's right, right across the river from here. This is in Shanahan. This is another lock tender's house. Right here, if you can see my cursor, these are still the hand wrought steel that went in because this is where the, um, 
the, the, the two doors were that they would close. This would fill up with water. The boat would come in and they'd slowly open this. The boat would come down and go this way. This is in Lockport. Uh, this is the Gaylord building. This was one of the uh, supply houses, um, the suppliers. You, it's hard to see right here in the corner, but there's three of these. These were the doors that the that the horses would draw, would come in and bring the, the uh, wagons to fill up with whatever stuff they were gonna buy. Here's from the outside. The reason I took this picture is I did all the concrete around here. I was the foreman on that job. This is now the uh, Will County Historical Society, but this is the um, construction house. This is where all, uh, all the money was distributed. This is where all the money was turned in. There's still a vault in there, but they now keep all the historical papers in. But I spend hours down here uh, talking to the people and I've donated some of my, my currency to them. So they have it for on display, but this is still, this is on State Street. And uh, this sidewalk or this little street right here, that, good, that other building I just showed you is right next to it. And back in the corner, again, across the street and back in the corner a little bit, is um, a, a building that was owned by a man by the name of Norton, Hiram Norton. He also uh, issued script and he is a talk in itself. He was a young man who was born in New York, grew up in, in, um, in orphanages. And at one time when he came to Lockport, he was, the, he was the wealthiest man. He paid the highest taxes, income tax one year in Will County because he made so much money. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dale. Uh, we do have a few more questions that have popped up. Uh, okay. One of them, uh, uh, Lawrence Edwards, do you know how long the canal actually functioned? Yes, uh, until, until 1915. From, eight, from 1848 till 1915. The last boat was 1915. I don't know the date of the last boat, but the last boat went down 1915. All right. Uh, kind of a follow-up to that, uh, also by uh, uh, Lawrence Edwards. I believe that it was actually or established as a historical site, and the Erie Canal historic site followed that model. Is that... Uh, yeah, yeah. 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 It's a, the the, the I&M Canal, the Heritage, Heritage Corridor, um, that's a, there's, there's state parks there. It's the, the Department of Natural Resources, the Illinois Department of Natural Resources maintain, <clears throat> I should say they, they're supposed to maintain it. There's quite a few trees down in there in the canal. Um, uh, again, it, 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 to me, it's a beautiful place. Other people might come down this time of the year. There is so much growth in the water itself that there's hardly any water. I, you, you really couldn't in my area, uh, uh, canoe down it right now. There's so many trees down and in the water. So it's, it's gone downhill, but it's still very historic. Uh, the the uh, Lewis University um, that has that, the house that has the room there of all the historical stuff, they bring their uh, cross country team down to run on the INM Canal. They bust them down to run there. So. Very interesting. Uh, another question from Daniel Wolf. Why did it fall into disuse and ultimately almost vanish? Did railroads make it obsolete? Exactly. Uh, railroads and they started to widen. Uh, these towns started to get bigger. Um, uh, Joliet at one. Joliet was a huge town at one time. Um, if, if you're of my age and guy, I did not serve in Vietnam, but guys that served in Vietnam knew of Joliet because they had a uh, 60,000 acre ammunition plant that su supplied most of the ammunitions for Joliet. Um, they had two or three steel mills in Joliet. Joliet was a huge town and now we have railroads. Now they make the canal wider for bigger barges once they got and the canal just became obsolete. Uh, another question from Al, uh, Al B. Did the Chicago Fire of 1870-71 impact canal operations? Probably not the operations because the canal is more on the south side. Um, but it, it did as far as, uh, it didn't affect the operations, but it certainly had an impact how they could bring now lumber up and, and from, from Wisconsin down 
and from all this timber they had in the open areas down where I live, all went up. So they had a better source of timber. So it helped them in a way, but it didn't slow it from what I see, it didn't slow it down. Interesting. Well, you'd mentioned this is my own question. You'd mentioned that some of the uh, parts of the canal, uh, you know, in the southern and western part are kind of overgrown. Are there any parts in the more urban areas of Chicago that were completely uh, kind of repurposed, uh, just completely, uh, you know, constructed over? Yes. Um, uh, even in there are sections where you can't do the whole 96 miles now on, on the path. Um, they put the, the sanitary ship canal cut right through it. So it stops at one point and picks up at the other side. Uh, there's over the highways are over the top of it. Um, even in Joliet, you, you can start in Lockport where the canal construction headquarters was and come down till you get to Joliet. And then you have to go on streets for about three or four miles to get back on the canal and go. So yeah, it, it's not a it's not a clean it's not a one long system anymore. Uh, any other questions? Um, people can chime in uh, with their voice or write it out. Um, I have a question about the, the currency itself. Uh, you mentioned that at one point there was like three or four years after it was issued before they had the funds to actually yes. redeem it. Um, did it, do you know if it actually functioned as a circulating medium by that point? Did people, you know, pass it from hand to hand or did people hold on to it and try and wait out the interest and, and everything like that? It was passed from hand to hand, but mostly as a discount. Uh, people would, um, uh, uh, again, it, it went it went at a discount, and how I know <clears throat> it traded hand to hand. Uh, three blocks from the State Bank in Chicago, the Randolph brothers owned a dry goods store. They issued script payable in INM Canal notes, so mm -hmm. they they sold stuff to the canal to the Canal Commission. They got paid in canal notes. So when you when you use their script, they paid you in canal notes. And there's another uh, gentleman, George W. Howe. Um, he issued notes from Rock Run, Will County. And I've been researching this for about 12 years. There is no Rock Run, Will County. There's a Rock Run Creek. I have notes. And some of his notes say payable and current bills. And some of his notes are crossed out and says i &M Canal script. Mm. So he did the same thing. That's really interesting. Um, does anyone else have any other questions for Dale uh, on this really, really intriguing topic? Um, I don't see any. Ben, let me think. I want to thank you and Emma for helping me out here. Um, uh, I do Chicago Coin Club meets uh, both in person and remote every month. And we do a thing called show and tell. And every month I have something I want to show and tell. And I do it, but I have to tell somebody. Uh, I have to eat, I have to send them my PowerPoint and they do it there. I, this month I'm going to try sharing my screen, so <laughs> we'll see what happens. Yeah, excellent, yeah, no problem uh, with, with the help. Uh, we did have one question just come in. Yeah, uh, what impact did the canal have on the level of uh, the urban water table of Chicago? I don't think it, it it affected it that much because most of that is is controlled by the um, by the lake. Um, uh, and, and it, if you know anything about the history of Chicago, they reversed the Chicago River because it used to flow into the lake and everybody dumped their sewage and stuff in there. So to clean up the lake, they did a, a again, man-made thing where it, it flows now the opposite way. But this part really uh, it didn't take much. Again, you're looking at um, from, from the lake to the end, you're looking at only... Uh, uh, 100, 114 miles or so, uh, 114 feet of, of elevation change. So it's very slow, the flow. That's why they picked that. And so it, it did, I, I don't think it changed it much, if at all. Uh, thank you for that. Um, yeah. I don't think that we have any other questions. We have a few lines of praise. Uh, one from another country boy from Illinois, Daniel Wolf. Uh, uh, Kathleen Smith says uh, really interesting. 
Um, yeah. so unless there are other uh, last minute questions, uh, we can uh, end a, a couple minutes early today. Yeah. And so I'll, I'll, like I'll, I'll be on next week to watch the Excellent. long table. So. I'm glad you've been enjoying it.